Good morning, I'm Pastor Carrie. And let me tell you, it's an honor and a privilege to bring this message I have for you this morning. Uh, it's, you're never alone, Jesus is always with us. It's something that really spoke to my heart as I prepared this message, and I really hope that you get something out of it today. I want to start with this quote by Timothy Keller. It says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known but not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved, well, is a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self un self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. This needs in life is to be known and to be loved. Often that leads us to seeking for fulfillment for temporary things in this world. But what if I told you that with Jesus, you're never alone? Today I want to talk to you about a woman who you may have read her story a hundred times. But her story is often overlooked because it's in the midst of a much bigger, more talked about story. I think that we can often feel overlooked by God, especially when we're in the midst of difficulties and struggles. So let's take a look at her story. But first, let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your word that brings life, your word that brings hope and joy and peace. Let it go deep into our hearts. Let it be mixed with faith. And let it bear fruit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about Hagar. Let me tell you a little bit about her first. She was a foreigner in a foreign land. She was an Egyptian servant to a wealthy Israelite couple who had no children, Abram and Sarai. Later they're known as Abraham and Sarah. And as the story goes, God promises that Abram would be the father of many nations. Both Abram and Sarai are very late in life. So, Sarah devises her own plan. Have you ever done that? Have you ever heard a promise from God and tried to come up with your own way of getting that promise fulfilled? Well, Sarai did. So she takes matters into her own hands, and in the hope of speeding up God's promise, she gives her servant Hagar to her husband to marry in the hopes that Hagar would bear them a child. So we're going to read Genesis chapter 16. If you have your Bible, open it up or turn it on if it's electronic. We're going to start in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. So the first mistake I see here is Sarai's impatience with God's timing. God made Sarai and Abram a promise. She wants to speed things along, so she gives Hagar to her husband as a wife. I don't see anything that could go wrong here, do you? So let's pick it up again in verse 4. Abram had sexual relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. This is my best part. So then Sarai said to Abram, Abram, this is your fault. I put my servant in your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show you who's wrong, you or me. Verse 6, Abram replied, look, she's your servant, so you deal with her as you see fit. Come on, this, this is such a mess right now. 
And what, do, what does everybody do? Have you ever been in this situation where everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else and nobody's taking responsibility for their own part? I don't know, maybe that's just me. And I, I love Abram's response. Look, it's not my problem, you deal with it. So what was Sarai's response? It was to treat Hagar so harshly that she ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside the spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. And the angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. So Hagar mistreats Sarai. Sarai takes it up a notch. So Hagar runs away. And what does God do? Does he say to Hagar, oh, you poor thing, I'm so sorry. Let me take you out of that mess. No, he actually replied to her and said, go back and do the right thing. Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Did you know that God will ask us to submit to our authority even if we're being treated harshly? I might be stepping on some toes right now because authority seems to be a bad word. We don't want authority telling us what to do. We don't want to submit to an unjust, maybe even a cruel or harsh authority. But see, God isn't always concerned with our rights because submitting to authority brings us blessing. What the angel of the Lord said to Hagar was, go back and submit to your authority and I will give you more descendants than you can count. He's going to bless us for submitting to that authority, for doing the right thing, even if we're being treated harshly. On a side note, the best book I've ever read on authority is Undercover by John Bevere. The rest I'll leave for now because it's a whole nother sermon. What I wanted to say is that God can work in the midst of conflict. Stay submitted and wait for God's timing. So let's pick up the story again. Hagar, she's sitting by the spring on her way back to Egypt when God tells her to go back to her mistress and submit to her authority. And in verse 11, it says, And the angel also said, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord hears the cries of your distress. Now hold on to that for a minute, because we're going to come back to that. Verse 13 says, Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, You are the God who sees me. She also said, Have I truly seen the one who sees me? And that brings me to my first point today. He is the God who sees you. He truly sees you. He sees where you're at. He sees your distress. He sees your need right now. God sees you. So after Hagar returns to Sarai, she does, does give birth to a boy, and she names him Ishmael, just as the angel had told her. And as the story unfolds, at this point, God changes Abram and Sarai's name to Abraham and Sarah. And what's interesting here is that God reconfirms his promise to Abraham and Sarah despite their unfaithfulness. Did you hear that? Despite their unfaithfulness, God reconfirms his promise to them. And I want to say that to you today, because despite your unfaithfulness, God is still faithful. Jesus is still faithful to you. And God does keep his promise to Sarah, and Sarah gets pregnant. She gives birth to a son named Isaac. It was after Isaac was born that things got even worse for Hagar. At this point, we're going to start reading from Genesis chapter 21, verse 8. 
It says, when Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, get rid of that slave woman and her son. He's not going to share in the inheritance of my son Isaac. I will not have it. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was also his son. But God told Abraham, don't be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar, Hagar's son, because, of, because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. How many times have you felt insignificant to God? How many times have you felt tossed aside and cast out? Let me tell you, God has not forgotten about you. You are not forgotten about. You are significant to Jesus. Picking up again in verse 15, when the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar and said to Hagar, What is wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. Now remember, Ishmael's name means the God who hears. And that brings me to my second point today. He is the God who hears you. Just like he heard Hagar and Ishmael's cries in the wilderness, God hears you. He hears your cries. He sees you. Psalm 56, 8 says, You keep track of all of my sorrows. You have collected all of my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Jesus will provide for your needs. This is a lesson I learned very early on in life. You see, I was raised by a single mom. It was my brother and I and, and my mom. And at the time that my father left, she was a stay-at-home mom. So she had no income. And there was this one particular time where we were really struggling. And my mother would look at what we had available to eat. And as she's planning the next week's meals, there wasn't enough. And she cried out to God. And without fail, every time, somebody would invite us over for dinner, whether it was family or somebody from church. And I'm here to tell you today that we never went without. We always had food in our belly. We always had clothes, clothes on our backs. God heard my mother's cries, and he provided for our every need. Jesus hears your cries in the wilderness. And I like how it says, God opened Hagar's eyes and she saw God's provision. Because sometimes we can get so focused inward, so focused on our lack and what we don't have that we can't see the provision that God has provided for us. We fail to see that God is at work in our story. You see, many times I fail to see God at work in my story. My mother always made sure to remind us of those times when we were really struggling and had no food. But later on, in a very particular difficult time in our family, I was a teenager. 
And I felt very alone, very much unseen and unwanted. And one particular night, I remember crying out to God in the darkness. You see, I didn't know that God had a plan and a purpose for my life. I felt very much insignificant, and I had no hope. And I cried out to God that night, and I said, God, if you have nothing for me, if there's no purpose for me, why am I here? What's the purpose? Just take me from this earth now, because I don't see the point of going on living. And just as I thought, he wasn't there for me. I never heard a response. And life went on. It was about that time that I ran away from God. And I vowed never to go back to this church. It was many years later as an adult when I started my own family. I decided that I wanted to teach my children something about faith. I wanted them to believe in something. So it began my search, and I, I tried different churches. I, I went to a variety of different churches of different denominations and, and beliefs. And there was this one particular church I remember for the first time hearing from God. He's like, why are you here? You're not going to find me here. And so out of obedience, I did. I returned to church here at the House of Praise. And that lonely night, as I cried out to God, had long since been forgotten. But as I came back to church, back to the house of praise, I began to serve and, and just learn about God and learn that, how to hear from God and, and learn that for the first time in my life that he did have a plan and a purpose for me. And then God reminded me of that night. And it was up here on this stage as I was worshiping God. For the first time in my life, I was free from hopelessness. I was free from anxiety and fear. And I felt the love and peace of God. And God reminded me of that one night where I felt so alone and so insignificant to God. And he spoke these words to me as I was up on this stage. He said, daughter, I heard your cries back then, and I heard you. I was with you. But had I taken you then, you would have missed out on all of this. And all of this was the first time I felt loved and accepted and truly at peace. There was a joy that could not be contained. I was loved by the God of the universe, the God who made heaven and earth. He saw me. He heard me, and he knew me. That brings me to my last point today. He is a God who is with you. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will never fail you. He will never abandon you. God is with you. He is for you. He is not against you. He sees you, and he hears your cries. See, what I failed to see back then when I was a teen, what I didn't realize was that God was with me. He was weaving and working in the middle of my story, and I didn't see it until God opened my eyes like he did for Hagar in the wilderness. Hagar was in the middle of the wilderness, ready to throw in the towel and give up on life. But God stepped in and opened her eyes like he did for me. And he showed me that there was a future and a hope for me. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Never was I forgotten about. I was not overlooked or abandoned by God, and neither are you. And you may be sitting here today thinking, yeah, God did that for you, but what about me? 
If you're listening today, let me say it's not by accident. God has a plan and a purpose for your life too. You might be in the midst of heartache and hardship and a struggle, but God sees you, God hears you, and God is with you. So today, I want to ask that you say this simple prayer with me. But more than just a prayer, I want you to believe in your heart that God truly sees you, that God truly hears you, and he is with you. And by committing your life to Jesus today, you're acknowledging that he is Lord and Savior over your life, that you will commit to follow his ways and his word for the rest of your life. There is nothing better than that. And if you're listening and you have prayed that prayer before, but after listening to this message, you, were, you realize you were like me and you ran away from God. Make a commitment today to follow him. So let's pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I admit today that I've sinned against you. I've run from you. I've disobeyed your word. And I commit today to live my life for you. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have prayed that prayer for the first time today, I want to ask you to do one thing for me. Tell someone. The simplest way to do that is to mark on your Connect card that you've committed to follow Jesus for the first time today. You can also email us at info at houseofpraise.cc and we can send you some literature about what that means and what your next step following Christ is. If you rededicated yourself to Christ today, there's an op option to check that as well. For everyone else, make a commitment today to attend the prayer and fasting that starts next Sunday, January 3rd, and runs through Sunday, January 10th. At 6 o'clock every night, we're going to gather either in person or online to pray for this church, to pray for our community, to pray for our nation, to pray for one another. Make that commitment today. It's always an awesome time. It was one of the first times that I learned, you know, how to pray in front of others, and it was just such a blessed time. Our tithe and offering scripture is from Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to contain it. Try it and put me to the test. Listen, I learned this very early on because even though we had very little, my mother was always faithful to tithe. And I'm here to say that we never went without. There was nothing we lacked. And I know that the blessings that have been in my life financially have been because of her faithfulness to tithe. Thank you for tuning in. Come back next week and have a blessed week.